I would like to introduce this call for discernment um, as one that is the most crucial call for all of Christianity worldwide. And I would like to do so by stating very briefly that before I was saved by the Lord, I was hopelessly lost in conspiracy theories. I was learning lots of truth, lots of things that are actually true. There are certain um, secret societies and things. There is something called the Illuminati. Uh, these things do exist. However, it's important to know the origins of them. For instance, lots of people do not know that Adam Weissat was a Jesuit. People do not know things like that. Uh, they're not interested. Men like Alex Jones will not discuss the Jesuits. Um, and unfortunately at the time, uh, I was not a Christian. I had no interest in Jesus Christ. And a great deal of what I was learning was just being spoon-fed me by lying New Age snake oil salesmen. Coming out of all kinds of bogus arguments about the Bible. And just lots of other nonsense. I can now see, however, that I was living in a, a foolish arrogance by presuming that I would be free from all of all of the um, the lies once the Lord saved me. Um, indeed, um, there's more deception I feel within Christianity than outside, and the reason being is Jesus Christ is the truth, and Satan is the father of lies. He has never stopped trying to kick up clouds of dirt to obscure the truth. And Christianity is far from exempt. Indeed, it appears that Satan's hardest work has gone into confusing Christianity. A sort of mimic of how God confused Satan's children at the Tower of Babel. Now, I'm making this video because the Lord has shown me but the majority of Christians believe in two specific sets of doctrine which have been created absolutely by the children of the devil and are thus inspired by the spirit of our enemy. Now for most Christians, the things I'm about to state and conclude upon will come as a surprise, but I would ask you to not simply dismiss the facts I will present, nor simply to believe everything I have said but rather pray to God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that he would reveal the truth of these matters to you and guide you in all truth by the power of his Holy Spirit. I make no apology for presenting this information quite informally and unprofessionally. I want for you to examine the facts for yourselves. The Lord has shown me that as his children we can only ever be truly convinced of something if our Father has told us it is true. May God guide you in all truth. The Reformation is a title typically given to the movement that saw the providence of God sweep across Europe with men independently seeking to translate the Bible into native tongues. Ultimately the people were enlightened by this and broke free of the yoke of papal authority, persecution and blinding false doctrine. Before this were the, the Dark Ages which as one would expect by its name, was a time in which Rome kept the masses blind, with only certain priests being allowed to read the scriptures. No questioning of papal authority was allowed, and of course before, as well as after the Reformation, if anyone were to be found translating the Bible, or reading it illegally, they were to be executed by the papacy. So the Reformation is absolutely crucial for all of Christianity. We have so much to be grateful for. Indeed, we should be praising God that we even have his word and that we can read it in peace. And yet so many people leave it on their shelves to collect dust. But it's the, the main debate of the Reformation. It's the main um, contradiction between the two parties that I want to examine here as we begin. In The Bondage of the Will, which was written by Martin Luther, he replied to the Roman Catholic scholar Erasmus, and Erasmus's diatribe, the freedom of the will. Though disagreeing 
with everything else Erasmus wrote. Luther at least commended Erasmus for recognizing that the, the crux of the matter at issue between Rome and the Bible believers was the debate over free will. In this regard, Luther wrote, but unlike all the rest, you alone have attacked the real issue, the essence of the matter in dispute, i.e. man's so-called free will and his salvation. You and you alone saw what was that grand hinge upon which the whole turned, and therefore you attacked the vital part at once, for which from my heart I thank you. And I thank him too, as it makes my job in this video that much easier, and it allows us to see Satan scheming, so that we are not ignorant of his devices. And from this, we can see that the major factor of debate for the Reformation, as identified by Luther, was God's sovereignty, or man's free will in his salvation. Something resolved so brilliantly by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9, with verses such as, 15 and 16, which say, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. The papists were on the side of the free will of man in his salvation, and the Protestants were on the side of God electing us to salvation as we are told in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, with verses like 4 to 6. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The doctrines of free will, and the most common form of eschatology, held by the overwhelming majority of supposedly prot uh, Protestant denominations, were in fact given to the churches by the Vatican, through their militant arm, the Jesuits. I will now elaborate on this matter, but before we continue, it is necessary to identify who the Jesuits are, and their purpose. The Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus, or Los Alumbrados, as it was originally known, which being interpreted is the Illuminati, was created by Ignatius Loyola in September of 1540. Loyola was the author of Spiritual Exercises, and he experienced mystic visions beginning in 1523. In the visions, it was revealed to Loyola that he was to be the originator and the master of a grand army that would do battle with what he considered Babylonian hordes. We can see that the Jesuits are a corrupt tree, which of course bears corrupt fruit, by the oath that they are to swear for initiation. And as such, anything to do with them is to be avoided at all costs. I was going to read some excerpts of the Jesuit Extreme Oath of Induction as recorded in the journals of the 62nd Congress, the United States Congressional Record. Um, however, it's, it's just far too blasphemous. Um, of course, it venerates Mary. Of course, it venerates the, the Pope, calling him holy and putting him in the place of God, of course. And it calls the superior general of the the Jesuits, it calls him the, the ghostly father, which I find both blasphemous and just a bit weird, really. Um, of course, it talks about uh, seeking to use subtlety and subterfuge uh, to undermine governments of the world um, and to depose kings and and leaders of countries. Of course, it very specifically attacks uh, Martin Luther, um, what it calls the, the Huguenots, uh, and Calvinists, and other Protestant groups at the time. And it basically says that they are to kill um, all Protestants 
if need be, and it says something about doing something horrible to their infants if need be. I find the whole thing absolutely disgusting and uh, I've decided actually that I will not read it out. I have however left a link for you to read it yourself if you so wish. The thing that strikes me of course is that the loving Lord Jesus Christ who told us to love our enemies and not to hinder the little children from coming to him would not have had such filth spew from his stainless lips as doing to children what is described in this oath. Um, it's not quite being as harmless as doves now, is it? Um, let alone the fact that the Lord told us not to swear oaths at all. Um, I, I feel it quite correctly identifies Jesuitism as a corrupt tree, and therefore anything that comes from Jesuitism is a corrupt fruit. And as believers, we have a duty to be aware and to leave it and have nothing to do with it. Uh, the scripture comes to mind when I read this oath, uh, Matthew 7.15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The intent of the Jesuits, and certainly the intent of Loyola, who believed he, he had received this call from Mary, the mother of Jesus, was to enact a counter-reformation, as it is called, to undo the work of the reformers. Being a man who despised the doctrines of grace, Loyola saw the Protestants as the Babylonian hordes, which he should exterminate from the face of the whole earth, as the oath declares. We certainly can know them by their fruits. We should not be surprised that the Jesuits fully recognized the significance of the great debate of God's sovereignty over man's free... Uh, uh, sorry, God's sovereignty or man's free will in salvation this debate was the the crux of the revolution uh, the reformation sorry as luther rightly identified it indeed the jesuits were even playing a part in this battle for biblical truth as i shall now show in 1545 the council of trent was convened by pope paul the third in this council the catholic church adopted a stance on justification that was blatantly contrary to the scriptures in Canon 9 of the Council, the Church declared, If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified, in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the uh, obtaining the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema, or accursed, that could be, I suppose. During the same council, the Jesuits were ordered by the Pope to make war silently and openly against the Reformation. And that's exactly what we see them doing. They were opposed to the doctrines of grace, that God saves men whom he has chosen before the foundation of the world, and said that it is man's free will that man must cooperate in some manner. I know that Arminians would strongly disagree that this is what they believe. However, when we look at history and when we look at the facts, we can see that uh, it tells a completely different story. When the papers of Archbishop Lord, a self-confessed Jesuit, were examined, this letter was found among them, dated March 1628 a Jesuit's letter sent to the rector at Brussels about the ensuing parliament. Now the design of this letter was to give the superior of the Jesuits, then resident at Brussels, an account of the posture of civil and ecclesiastical affairs in England. Here is an extract of that letter. Father Rector, let not the damp of astonishment seize upon your ardent and zealous soul in apprehending the unexpected calling of a parliament. We have now strings to our bow. We have planted that sovereign drug, Arminianism, which we hope will purge the Protestants from their heresy. And it flourisheth and bears fruit in due season. For the better prevention of the Puritans, the Arminians have already locked up the Duke of Buckingham's ears. 
and we have those of our own religion 